Welcome to the Expert PK and Newbie Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Expert PK and Newbie Podcast, the podcast where each week we take a passage of the Bible, we read it together and we get the three different perspectives of three different people. Now, as always, I have with me Lachlan Miller, our expert. Hello. Morgan Carter, our newbie. Hi. And I'm Joshua Lee, the PK pastor's kid. How are we all doing, guys? Well, I have just recently returned from a European adventure, and yes. so I am going very well. Thank you very much. Yes, that's the reason why there's a bit of a break between this Q&A episode and all the other episodes, just <laughs> yeah, to accommodate your trip. <laughs> but it was a good trip? Oh, excellent. Like, Em and I had the best time, um, a lovely holiday. We'll, we'll call it our second honeymoon, although mm. I think Em was just doing that to see if any places would give us freebies, which they didn't. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> that's okay. Still, fantastic trip, seeing lots of the world. I'm a little bit of a history buff, and so especially exploring places like Rome or Cairo were particularly interesting to me in some highlights of the trip. Mm. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you, Morgan, but I think when we get asked how we are both going, it's not going to compare to, the, the, <laughs> to going to Europe. Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> but, Morgan, how are you doing? Haven't been to Europe this year, so <laughs> but I'm didn't... all right. Um, what were you going to say, Look, <laughs> I, I was going to say, in our previous Q&A episode for Matthew... We recorded it while you were in the UK. I remember it was snowing okay. outside. Yeah, touche. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm good. I've just booked a three-week trip for October to Southeast Asia to go backpacking. So oh, nice. mm, wow. something different, something to look forward to, but just working away, building up the leaves. Mm. Nice. How are you, Josh? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's just hunkering down and just working at the moment. No fun holidays. No holidays planned? I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I've got a little Melbourne trip that Alyssa and I are going to. Nice. Um, Is it this week or no? Sorry, not this week. Sorry, next week. So that'll be fun. Not, you know, not as exciting as going to either Asia or Europe, (laughs) but that's okay. That's all right. At least it's some time away, but just being deep into church-related stuff, working and also cadets. I was at a cadet conference. Um, in you can imagine sitting in a conference chair for the entire day, listening to different presentations. Yep. Interesting stuff, but also sitting down for an entire day isn't the funnest thing in the world. But no, I'm doing I'm doing well. So like what we did last season, this episode is a bit different because we've actually finished Genesis. Mm. Like we're 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 all, we're all done with the very first book of the Bible, and now we're at to that point where we actually get to hear from our listeners, and we get to hear some comments, but we also get to hear uh, their questions. Questions and we're going to try to the best of our ability. Like, yes, we have one expert, or you know, <laughs> we, we we call Lachlan the expert, um, and Morgan and I, we're you know, we're we're or oh, us three, we're trying, we'll try our best to try and answer some of these questions. Mm. But you know, this is an opportunity to engage with you, the audience, and you, the listener. And and see, you know, what discussions this all sort of leads to. And talking about sort of engaging with, with you guys, if you haven't, if you don't know, we say it every week, but we've got a Patreon. So if you want to financially support us that way, head over to Patreon and we get to see your comments. We get to see the questions that you guys put in there and we get to interact with you that way. So if you want to support us financially, in a financial sense, you get extra long episodes, early episodes, um, more content that way, then head over to Patreon and don't forget to just keep up to date with our social media. Medias. So let's kick off with our first question. Mm. So our first question comes from an anonymous uh, patron and they say, Lachlan said in the Patreon version of the podcast that creation could be used as evidence for God's existence. Can you explain that more? Well, this is a pretty good plug for our Patreon because I remember listening to the public release of our very first episode of Genesis and being like, oh, our discussion about evidence for God wasn't in there. <laughs> and that's because we locked it behind a paywall. Yes. Uh, to, to look behind the scenes, we sort of what we record for an hour and a half to two hours. And mm. so there's a lot of uh, either us just working out the, what we're going to say and just getting like ourselves in the right headspace, <laughs> to put it nicely. <laughs> a lot of laughter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of laughter, depending on what uh, time of the day it's also being recorded in. But also to try and cut down an episode from what, an hour and a half to two hours down to a nice... Uh, like, you know, tight 45 minutes, but also our Patreons get, you know, the extra long one. We have to cut things out. And Mm. so with the Patreon, we just have to pick and choose and try and go, well, this is, 
this is the core information that we're you know giving here for the public because we don't want to we don't want to skew the word of god or we don't want to no, you know no. like exclude the word of god in any sort of form but at the same time we have to do our best to like you know not leave too much on the cutting room floor um and in this instance that just sort of just happens <laughs> <laughs> that's all right so for the non patreons um firstly become a patreon secondly i said in our very first episode that creation itself can be used in almost two different ways to argue for God's very existence. And so the two ways that I said were, firstly, the origin of the universe, so something that's known as the Kalam cosmological argument, and the second was the fine-tuning of the universe. And so clearly we should talk about this a little bit more. And so let me start with what is known as the Kalam cosmological argument. Now, this is developed by William Lane Craig, so if you're after way more information about this topic. Look up William Lane Craig. He has a really good animated video on this, as well as lots and lots of scholarly work and books on it. And so the argument goes like this. Premise number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the conclusion, the universe has a cause. So that's the argument. That's the Kalam cosmological argument. Sounds really, really simple, doesn't it? Is there any initial questions from uh, Morgan or Josh about that? I'm just trying to wrap my head around the definition of it. Mm. Could you say it again? (laughs) (laughs) Sure. (laughs) So premise one, the first premise is the idea that whatever begins to exist Mm -hmm. has to have a cause or a reason that it began to exist. Yeah. Now, this is basically a metaphysical principle. It's the basis of all modern science. It's something that forms the very foundation of how we engage with the world around us, which is Mm. that things have causes. Yeah. So that's the first premise. The second premise is the universe began to exist. And now almost all modern science agrees with this. The Big Bang Theory is the most well-supported theory about the origins of the universe. There's many other scientific and mathematical evidences that the universe had to have a beginning. Mm -hmm. So there's that premise sort of proved. Mm. And then you lead into the conclusion, therefore the universe must have had a cause. Because if both premise one and premise two are true and correct then it just logically follows the universe has a cause. Okay, cool. So it's putting the two together, mm. not saying that they're separate, but saying, well, because there was a start, it had to, there's something had to cause it to begin. Mm. Yep. Yep. Now I've got you. I've got you now. And I mean, we just say, well, the cause is God. Um, we can actually do a little bit better. Than okay. That, there we go. If I may. Yep. Because I agree that. The conclusion is the universe had a cause and you can sort of go whoop de doo mm, Yep. <laughs> doesn't mean we know what it is. Yeah. But if you then just do some simple deductions, mm-hmm. you start to identify what the cause must be. So here's what we can figure out about the cause. Firstly, it must be uncaused because you can't have an infinite loop. Okay. So um, mathematically, yep. you can't go backwards into infinity. Yep. So there has to be a first cause somewhere, right? This yes. isn't even just a Christian worldview thing. Yeah. This is a, no matter what worldview you hold, you either believe something came from nothing, which goes against premise one, mm-hmm. or you believe something eternal exists and then have to figure out what it is. Yeah. And so the first thing we know about this cause is that it must be uncaused. The second thing that we learn about this cause is it must be immaterial because all matter and energy came into existence with the universe. Mm. And so it needs to be immaterial. It also needs to be spaceless and timeless because it existed before all space and all time. Mm. Now, the problem with one thing having all of these characteristics is how do you have an uncaused, timeless thing create a temporal effect? Here's the analogy I like to use. If the room we're sitting in right now was always full of flammable gas... Yep. And the cause, which the cause of that room going on fire would be a spark, right? Yes. If that spark has always existed, uh, yep. then the room would always have been on fire. Yeah. However, we're in a situation where we're saying that this cause or this spark has always existed, except the effect it creates hasn't always existed. Yeah. And okay. the only way to account for a cause always existing, but the effect of that cause not always existing is to say that there was a mind behind it, that there is sentience behind it, capable of making a decision. Yeah, so there was a choice involved to do something. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that is how the Kalam cosmological argument goes from the universe had a beginning to here are the characteristics of what that cause must have been to it lines up super, super well with our conception of God. Mm. It makes sense. A little bit of having to juggle in my own brain and all of a sudden I'm just thinking of interstellar. That's the, like the first <laughs> the first space black hole time mm-hmm. thing that I thought of. Like how to, they're trying to get my head around it. Okay, so now that makes sense of the something always being there and then something starting mm. and then how does how does that happen and saying, well, there was a choice. And so are we saying Yahweh, God being the always there the uncaused cause cause, yes and then his choice to create creation Mm. is 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 that choice that then sparks the like our timeline yeah effectively uh, yeah effectively to continue to go Hmm. that's a big that's a big answer for like our first question it's a a big place to start (laughs) i agree I mean, yeah. Talk about starting in the beginning. Uh, <laughs> like this is like like trying to like the work very, out very beginning, yes. the very beginning, and and how that sort of works. When I'm like listening to it, I just keep thinking of the chicken and the egg, which came first. <laughs> Fair. Mm. <laughs> just for the record, to answer that question from an evolutionary worldview, the uh, egg came first, but. That's not what you're saying at all, so we'll move on. <laughs> no, I think the chicken came first, but we won't go there. <laughs> the second evidence I used for God's existence from the creation of the universe is the fine-tuning argument. Now, this is an argument that has honestly existed as long as modern science has existed. And the reason for that is the very first scientists in a Western context were Christians, and they believed that they could find order in the universe because they believed in one who ordered it. Mm. And so when you start looking at the real specifics of our universe, then the universe is either the biggest fluke in history, <laughs> the fact that life could develop, or it was designed this way. Mm. And so there's like really small ones, like the orbit of the earth can't be much different, but that's only on a magnitude of like one or 2%, mm. which is nothing compared to if you go into some of the physics of it. So oh, do yeah. I have permission to go <laughs> a little bit into the physics? I mean, this was your. You lost me at the word physics. (laughs) (laughs) This was your previous degree. Yes, I do have a physics degree, so part of me is really excited by the thought of going into physics. What what do you reckon, Morgan? Should we let him? I did not know you had a physics degree. I just learnt that about you. (laughs) Well, I do. (laughs) I don't know what else to say about it. Like, I haven't. (laughs) I've forgotten most of it, but that's okay. All right, there are four forces that hold the universe together, right? Mm -hmm. You got the strong force, which is effectively what holds atoms together. You got the electromagnetic force, which is, you know, you know, electricity and magnetism. You guys understand that. You've got what's called the weak force, which is what causes things to actually decay. And then you have gravity, which pulls everything together. Now, these forces have to be so precisely balanced against each other that if they were different by even the smallest amount, then our universe would look radically different and not be life-supporting. So we're talking like if you're tuning a guitar is probably the best illustration I can use. You need the length of each of these strings to be exactly right. Otherwise, you're too sharp or too flat. And if you're not bang on the perfect pitch, life can't exist. Mm. And so some examples are when a star is forming... The strong force and the electromagnetic force need to be perfectly balanced because if the strong force was too much stronger than the electromagnetic force, then everything would kind of chunk together too much. Mm. Whereas if the electromagnetic force was too strong, it would start to push out and be too big. And therefore, the star couldn't maintain itself and would fall apart. Mm. Now, this is how precisely tuned those forces need to be. They need to be perfect to 10 to the minus 16. Now, that is a zero followed by a decimal place, Mm -hmm. followed by 16 zeros, followed by a one. (laughs) Like that is how precise it needs to be. Mm. There's no no margin for error. No. Another example is even if we just stick on with stars, like the electromagnetic force and gravity need to be so perfectly balanced that if they were different by 10 to the minus 40, Mm. then you could either only have big stars or only have small stars and you sort of need both to actually have life because the very base elements we're made for couldn't exist Mm. unless you have both type of stars. Now, those are pretty crazy 
numbers in physics. Mm. If you were to jump over to something like biology, oh yeah, you also get some pretty crazy numbers. Uh-huh. Like I, we we all have DNA. Yep. Let's just pretend that magically we have all the proteins that make up DNA in a jar. If you shook that jar around, the chances of them aligning in a way that d- that DNA would even be functional at even the smallest level is at odds of one in ten to the hundred and thirty. Mm. Like that itself, like just for DNA, even if you already have all the pieces, which is add more odds in there, is one in 10 to the 130. Now to give that number some uh, um, comparison, the universe is 10 to the power of 18 seconds old. And there are 10 to the power of 80 atoms in the entire observable universe. How did they, sorry, this is questions of like, how do you count that? (laughs) Like how do you work that out? <laughs> how do you know? How do you how do you get to that number? <laughs> when it comes to atoms of the observable universe, you can basically just count the stars because everything else is tidy. And so yeah, truth. There's lots of space. You look at stars. You look at their size. You can tell by what color light we get from Earth. What yeah that's is right. the primary element in a star? In a star, yeah. And then you can kind of do the maths from yep. there, and you get approximately ten to the eighty. Mm. atoms in the observable universe, yep. which is still nothing to 10 to the 130 odds of like even our base DNA aligning. Mm. And so as you slowly start to look at all of the fine tuning in the universe, you get to the point of going, we've either hit the biggest fluke ever yep, or it was created in this exact way. Mm. And that is effectively the fine tuning argument. Now, I'd be amiss if I didn't bring up the biggest number of them all, which is Sir Roger Penrose figured out that the odds of a universe without entropy existing was 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. Now, that's a power of a power. Yep. And that's a bigger number than any of us can even comprehend. Mm. Like you could write the biggest number you know for the entirety of your life onto one atom and then have that number multiplied into every atom in the observable universe and you're still not even getting close Mm. to the odds of our universe having the entropy that it does which again is necessary to support life yes and so you end up in the situation where the fine-tuning universe is a scientific fact and you either just need to play the odds Mm. or you need to admit or concede that it really, really looks like it was designed this way. Yes. You fully lost me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's pretty nuts, like when like looking at all all that. And I mean, you just like look for us. You sort of just have to like you know like look at your own sort of body and how that mm-hmm. like how that operates compared to sort of other mammals or or different things like the ability for us to be able to be three th- free thinking mammals and have mm-hmm. a conscious like. Or just even going down to like the the eye and how the eye is so perfectly tuned Mm -hmm. so that we can see, you know, light, the spectrum of colors, everything coming, like every bit of information that comes into our eye and how it like that, you know, if you've got 20-20 vision, um, that is. (laughs) I do not. uh, The... Like it, it, your eye has to be so precise and if something were just slightly amiss, well, then we can't see or we can't see as good. Like you look at other animals and th- their vision is quite lacking uh, than others. Like the common thing is like dog's vision. Like and we use it as like, oh, do you have dog vision? Is saying as using it as a, as a term of like, well, you have bad vision. From a biological point of view, it's like just there's so many things that our human body does mm. that we – just take for granted whereas like well if it was ever so slightly fair like dna and how we could sort of constructed was ever so slightly different we wouldn't we just crumble and not we would lack so many capacities mm. that make us human yeah yeah and so just from like that level not even like you know looking at like the big the, cosmological level oh yeah. yeah the stars the universe everything that happens there and it's like it's it's just amazing god's creation mm. and how sort of everything you know, it works and yeah. how just we're on this spinning rock and it can sustain life. Mm. Whereas like what you said, if we're just slightly, you know, too far forward, too far backwards, it would be completely different. Yeah. And that's where Genesis starts so is God as creator. Mm. And as you think about that more and more, it leads to some of these places like the fine tuning of that creator or just the fact that creation exists full stop. Mm. Like I, I really enjoy thinking about those types of things. Even if I 
occasionally lose Morgan in the process. I'm so sorry. I'm like, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, Morgan, what, what do you, do you, do you often think of, like, for lack of a better way, God's creation and how we're sort of formed and how sort of miraculous that is? Or have you never thought of that before? I haven't really thought about it, like, to that extent. Mm. Like, I thought that's pretty cool, but I haven't really looked into it. <laughs> no, that's I fair. I not overthink it. Like, I'm just going to accept it for what it is and that it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> no, I get that. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll freak myself out and, yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, and, and also, like, we live and so we take all this for granted. Like, you know, we, we get we get up, we wake up, we go to our day, we go back to sleep, we wake up again. Like, you know, like the cycle continues of our mm. life that yeah. we, we, we just, this is normal for us. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's like a subconscious part of me that doesn't want to overthink it to make myself question it too much. Like being fully honest, like I don't want to. Mm. Yeah, okay. Because I would say that's why I think about it a lot and deeply is I truly believe that Christianity is the truth which means I'm not afraid of thinking about things because ultimately it will always lead back to the truth. Yeah. And so that's why I loved doing a science degree as a Christian because Mm. every time I learned something about God's creation, I got to be in awe of it and there was nothing that came up studying science at a university level that ever made me question God or my faith because God is the author of all of it and it all does align with his character and purposes. Yeah. Hmm. If I could just encourage you in that. Fair rebuttal. <laughs> I wasn't trying to rebut you <laughs> as much as encourage you. <laughs> so we're very thankful for that Patreon question. And I just want to take this time to highlight some of the Patreon comments that we get and that you guys comment on the individual episodes that we release. So our first comment comes from the Patreon A. Lee. And it's from episode nine. And there we're looking at Genesis chapter twenty twenty two was going to just bring up what that was because i'm sure no one actually remembers sacrifice of isaac <laughs> oh okay the birth of isaac and uh, the sacrifice of isaac of course you remember all right mr smarty pants also abraham once again failing and pretending sarah was his wife abimelech was in there what? do you remember that this is why he's the expert <laughs> <laughs> Slash, I'm sure you've been sitting with all of this for such long, for so long that you just know it. And in that episode, we look at the birth of Isaac, but we also look at the sacrifice of Isaac and that struggle of Abraham getting tested there. And so Ailey says, The next morning, I was in the kitchen alone cleaning up after our breakfast when I distinctly heard a voice remind me of Abraham and Isaac's story and God saying, I looked after Isaac. I will also look after your children. God also said, I know what this feels like. Look at my son. I was amazed and encouraged and continued to hang on to this promise. And I think that's a wonderful comment and a bit of encouragement to sort of get because God will not only look after the people that we read in the Bible, he Mm. looked after Isaac, Abraham, Sarah, also his son, Jesus, as we sort of looked at the two linking, you know, sort of there is the, the, the one true sacrifice being Jesus and sort of no one else, that God will also look after us. That's a really lovely comment. And then our other comment comes from episode 12, where we look at chapters 29 to 31, where Jacob has four different wives, and mm-hmm. that's where we start to see the tribes of Israel get born and uh, this comment comes from Doris and she says lol funny enough the old wives tale of gazing slash longing for something during conception slash pregnancy still continues partly in the Arabic culture it is still often murmured that if a pregnant woman has a craving and does not satisfy that craving it will appear as a birthmark on the child in the shape of that thing she craves i.e. if she craves apples and doesn't satisfy that craving, baby will be born with an apple-shaped birthmark. Wow. So that's clearly in relation to when Jacob puts a bunch of white branches in front of the sheep as they are mating Mm. and suddenly all the sheep, baby sheep come out stripy, which is exactly what his father-in-law agreed to give him Mm. from the flock. And so it's interesting that that continues. Yeah, that sort of that cultural touchstone, that thought process has sort of gone throughout history and, and, and culture and still sort of is is there today, which is very interesting to sort of hear. Mm. 
and I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have known about it, you know, without sort of hearing it through the Bible. But then also I wouldn't have known that it's sort of, that thought process is still sort of around today. Well, it's an old wives' tale, Doris is saying. <laughs> but nice that we can read out just a, a selection of some of the comments that our Patreons leave us. Yeah, yeah. So if you want your, you know, comment being heard or if, um, you know, you want to engage us that way, head over to Patreon because we do see all your interactions that way. On to the next questions. All right. So our next question is from Lucas and he asked, why would God say multiple times that he made the world in six days if he didn't? It isn't just Genesis that says six days in a non-poetic section of scripture. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11, the command to keep the Sabbath says it clearly. So Lucas is clearly a young earth creationist. And so I think what we need to start by doing is going to the reference that he brought up. So everyone, Bibles, Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. So Exodus 20 verse 8 to 11 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So, is Lucas right? Does this force us to take a literal young earth creationist viewpoint of Genesis 1? I don't really know what you mean by young earth creationist, to be honest. Young earth creationist is the literal interpretation of saying like God literally made the earth in six days, Mm. Um, rather than it poetically saying, well, it was made in this order but the days aren't really mattering. Like how long it uh, took to make those days doesn't really matter too much. It's just more so maybe the order. And this is describing uh, in more of a poetic sort of descriptive way of doing it, how it was created. Hmm. Yeah, the Young Earth view just reads Genesis 1 as straightforward, literal, historical, scientific account of Hmm. creation. Now to answer your question, does this then force us to be like, well, is it actually six days that it was created? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I would I, I still want to sit in the bank of saying no, but my reasoning being is that could still just be so that part of scripture that we just read in Exodus could still just be referring to the part in Genesis, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense, and not necessarily saying, "Well, this is what God did." It's just a reference. It's just saying, "Well, this is like see Genesis for what He did," but it's. But I think the more importantly, it's describing this Sabbath, not necessarily the actual creation part. It's Mm. giving the reason for the Sabbath. Yeah, I would totally agree. If anything, I would say that this verse in Exodus helps explain why God poetically explains creation in seven days because he Mm. wants to ground his entire nation's view of the world into a seven-day work week where you work for six days and you have a Sabbath. Mm. Like I would say that that is the correct ordering rather than he happened to have made it in seven days and then made it a law. Mm. The other thing I would say is anyone who has ever sat through a sermon knows that you can use well-established fictional stories to ground a point. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, my pastor growing up was Scottish, and so he would use Braveheart and William Wallace as an example in, I reckon, every second sermon. And so William Wallace was prepared to die for freedom. Mm. Therefore, my pastor would say, Jesus was prepared to die for your freedom in the same way. Like, you can use it as an example, as an illustration. Yes. Now, even Jesus uses this technique. Yes. Read literally any parable of Jesus, and he will ground important theological truths in a made-up story about a farmer, for instance. Mm. Like we have the sower planting his seeds on four different soils, and Jesus says, therefore, you too should sow your seed, or therefore, you too know what type of soil you are. Like Jesus can use fictional stories to ground important epic theology. Mm which is why I don't think there's anything about Exodus 20 that enforces a strict seven-day creationist viewpoint on Genesis 1 Mm. would be my response. And humans are really good at making up um, 
metaphors and stories to further sort of prove a point or explain an idea. Mm. More so the explaining an idea is where we sort of start to use metaphors and that uh, less literal language Mm. uh, to sort of get that point across. But I do agree with you. I don't necessarily think it forces you into sort of that viewpoint. But, you know, in the other... other, uh, the other side of it, it doesn't. It's not against that viewpoint either. Mm, yes, I'd agree. So while we're talking about views of creation, I'm going to move us on to the next question. And this question comes from Emily, and it says, "Why doesn't Lachlan hold to the old Earth view?" Now, if you remember our very first episode of Genesis, we discussed three different views of creation. They were the young Earth view, the old Earth view, and the literary view. And if I do say so myself, I gave a pretty good defense of the old Earth view. And then I said I didn't believe it. So (laughs) this is probably a pretty fair question. But before I go on to explain my thoughts, I thought it would be interesting to ask both of you where you are currently at, because we discussed this a long, long time ago. Mm. Um, Morgan, you were unsure. Josh felt very confident about his view at the time. But I'm just (laughs) curious about if you've landed anywhere differently since having plenty of time to think about it. I can't remember what the views were. (laughs) So the three views we gave was young earth, which is literal 24-hour days of creation. The other one was old earth, which was that creation happened in the exact order described, but it wasn't in seven-day seg. Sorry, it wasn't in 24-hour segments. It was in like day one could have been a million years and day two could have been three million years. Like they were just ages or groups of time. And the third view, the literary view, was the one that says Genesis 1 is purely poetic and we're only meant to find theology within it, not science or history. Those were our three viewpoints we discussed. Mm. Can I pick all three? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'd say some of them are contradictory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking how, how all three would work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you could have two. Yeah, yeah. But there were three. Unless you were like, this part's old, this part's new, this part's old, this part's new. (laughs) For me, I still think I sit in the camp of the old earth view. But I also want to have that that literary view as well. Because I think we mustn't forget why it's there, Mm -hmm. like why we have it. So I think that's why I want to also incorporate that into it. Because I don't want to just get lost in... The recounts of events or just like the stories that it tells and want to sort of get the the theological answers or the things that you need to sort of, that God wants you to grapple with as well. So I think I still sit in that camp of the old old Earth view, but I also want to acknowledge the literary uh, side of it as well. Fair. And so are we saying, Morgan, that you're still just on the confused slash not committing to a side? Yeah, I feel like I don't have enough knowledge of the Bible apart from what we've really looked into to have an opinion about it. Like I'd like to read a few more different books to kind of think about it a bit more. Mm. Not sure why. I just feel like I need a a more informed decision. (laughs) What, a one-hour episode on the topic? Was it enough (laughs) for you to be like, ah, I know everything? (laughs) No, because I was just so, like I said, I was so shocked by Genesis. It wasn't what I expected. Mm. Um, So... I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't that at all. So, yeah, I'm still on the fence about what what I think. And that's okay. Mm. We're not forcing you to jump into a camp and then wholeheartedly defend that camp to the death yet. Yeah, no. Nah, I I want to learn more to kind of make my decision. Mm. That's fair enough. Yeah. For me, I still hold to the literary view that I held in our very first episode. The reason I don't hold to an old earth view of creation Mm -hmm. is while I love that the modern science helps explain well what happens, part of interpreting a biblical text for me is determining what the original author was trying to communicate Mm -hmm. and what the original audience would have taken away from the text. Mm. And my biggest problem with the old earth view is that it's a view that could only be held by a modern audience. The original author being Moses probably could not have had that concept. The original audience, being ancient Israel, probably would never have held an old earth view. But we do find writings of Jewish scholars for both the young earth view and the literary, purely poetic account view. Mm. And so because I like to think about what the original audience is receiving and learning, 
I side with the literary view as the only view I hold in Genesis 1 mm-hmm. because that is something the original audience could have held yeah. and is something that ancient Jewish writers wrote about as a legitimate viewpoint, mm. if that makes sense. No, that does. That does. And, and it's, that's the trap we, as readers reading it like today and now, is we tend to think with our 21st century brain because mm. that's just what we're used to. Like, yeah, of you know, That's how we just uh, observe the here and now. That's the sort of viewpoint that we've sort of, you know, got into our head that's, that's sort of stuck. So I think it's very important to sort of recognise where this has all come to and, and look at it through that lens. Mm. Uh, our next question comes from Jamie and they ask, if you believe in evolution, you need to believe in death before the fall. How does that fit with the biblical worldview? Lots of questions from episode one is mm. the vibe I'm getting so far. Yep. Well, thoughts from the table. I, I have, a, have a potential answer, but curious about other thoughts first. To clarify what, what's being asked here, is Jamie saying that the four, so Adam and Eve sinning, mm-hmm. being the first sinners, and then the rest of the world reaping the... Not benefits, consequences. <laughs> yes, the consequences. The rest of the world, you know, reaping the consequences of that action. Is it then saying that as a result of that sin, of the very first sin, death was created? The common Christian conception is that death entered creation with the fall. Like God says... Do not eat from the tree because in the day that you eat, you will die. So the consequence of that first sin is death. And because Adam and Eve didn't die immediately, it is like, oh, it's introducing the concept of death into humanity. Hmm. Now, that's taking a very literal view on God saying, well, you will die on Mm -hmm. it. And it doesn't take into it, for me anyway, it doesn't take into the account that God still planned for humans to die, but the either the way you die will not be how God originally intended, or you will die of disease, uh, like murder, like there will be plagues, wars, famines, all this other like terrible things in, in the world. That's one way you could interpret like there is there will be so much other negative forces that come that they sort of spur out of like this sin that that like that's what death might mean mm. in a, in a, in a in a in a way I'm sort of um unpacking my own thoughts in real time here <laughs> fair enough <laughs> I've also heard people argue from verses like John 3:16 that therefore Genesis must be referring to spiritual death because mm. Jesus brings spiritual life I've also heard that argument mm. because sort of like going back to like the other question of like you know old earth view, young earth view of it. So if we take the old earth view on it and saying, well, there was no death before this sin from an old earth viewpoint, well, then that sort of would say that the no humans died in that old earth Mm -hmm. view up until that point. So, you know, in that old earth view, God selected this, this particular group or, you know, Adam and Eve in it to be that, like, to be that chosen people and for the what we see in Genesis to happen that's like you know one one way of sort of thinking or looking at, at it so well then yeah you wouldn't have death so you would have all these people that just didn't die up until this point and then all of a sudden death would roll in hmm. it's interesting that you're only thinking about the human so far yes because i think the reason this question has come to us is the influence of young earth creationism which says that there was no death of any type whatsoever before the fall including animal death mm. has been the common belief amongst that viewpoint for i assume as long as it's existed what are your thoughts Lachlan? <laughs> <laughs> i would start by just rejecting the claim that there was no death before the fall as a claim the creation process rejects the rejection of death at every point i know i double negative that not ideal let me explain it better which is that like day three god creates plant life right and mm. literally in the text it explains the system of plant life it talks about how seeds will come from these plants and sprout up and that is a process that involves death mm. like just for plants to reproduce involves death now i've never heard a young earth creationist say there was no plant death before the fall but death like a living thing no longer replicating is a very literal form of death and plant death clearly existed before the fall because that's what adam and eve ate Mm. Then you get to the animals and you see that we have an ecosystem that is so well designed 
where animals eat animals, eat animals, eat plants. Like it's just so well designed at every level to claim that that is just a result of sin and the fall doesn't make sense to me. Mm. You can even jump to places like Psalm 104, where it makes it very clear that the young lion roars for their prey, stalking the food that God provides for them. Like Psalm 104 says that the system of lions hunting is part of the God-given ecosystem. Mm. Like there's certain animals you can look at and you can't just argue that uh, because of sin, they totally radically changed and now they consume meat. Mm. It just seems like the ecosystem we have with plant death and with animal death was always the plan. Mm. And I can't see biblically how you can even start to argue the opposite of that. Which leads me to the conclusion that I think what happened with the fall was death being introduced where there was not meant to be death. Yes. So hopefully we all remember my discussion about the tree of life that Mm -hmm. was planted in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life is what provided Adam and Eve with the potential of eternal life. Mm. In the book of Revelation, at the end of everything, God replants that tree in the new creation. And again, that is how eternal life is seen to be a thing is because of the presence of the tree of life. Mm. And so Adam and Eve, who God either created for the first time or chose out of a larger population, we had that discussion in episode two about Adam and Eve. Mm. However, he did it. Adam and Eve were never intended to die had they continued to follow God's commands because they were given the antidote to death. Mm. And so by sinning, death was introduced into their line. Mm. Their line was going to be the promised priestly line of following Yahweh forever and yet suddenly human death is a part of the experience of everyone Mm. because of the fall and that's how I begin to understand Mm. this topic. I think that's where I was sort of trying to get to with my thought process of death being introduced like death always being a thing but then it being introduced where it wouldn't have been Mm. Um, and, and the ability to die from other causes other than God's plan, if you will, for it. For it. Mm, mm. For those of you who can't see Josh, he has a really thoughtful look on his face right now, <laughs> which I suspect is a side of he needs to give this topic a lot more thought outside of now, potentially. No, it's just fasc- It's just fascinating. Yeah, it's just fascinating because we could spend an, I've, I'd, for, for me, we could just spend an entire podcast talking about this topic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's one of the excellent things about a Q&A episode mm. is every time a question is raised by someone, they care about the answer. We get really intrigued and we could talk about it for a long time. Oh, yeah. Um. So our next question is from an anonymous listener and it is, does Genesis 9 permit the death penalty? Good question. <laughs> Whoa. Well, I mean, first of all, let's all turn to Genesis 9. It's probably a really excellent way of starting this discussion. Yes, let's uh, see what it actually is about. So verses 5 and 6 in Genesis 9 say, And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man... By man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. So Genesis 9 is saying that humanity is made in God's image. Humanity is therefore kind of special, unique, infinite value. Those are all things that we touched on at some point in the book of Genesis, I'm sure. And therefore, whoever sheds human blood by human hands shall their blood also be shed. So in other words, if you kill a human, you should also be killed, which I guess leads to our question. Is it okay for the death penalty? Now, we live in Australia, which means we do not have the death penalty. That is not a thing that exists in our legal system. But I know many countries around the world do have the death penalty. Ancient Israel had the death penalty. And so what are what are our thoughts? I actually got really passionate about this on the weekend because I was on TikTok and I got stuck on death row TikTok and I couldn't stop watching them because I was so intrigued. Mm. And I'm like all for the death penalty because I think it's like a life for a life. I'm not sure how great that is being a Christian, but yeah, I don't know. Mm. I believe in the death penalty. So, so, oh, I'm just, yeah, just surprised by the TikTok. (laughs) <laughs> it's just it's just a just a funny like um it's it's not a subsection of TikTok that I've ever heard of. <laughs> the death row TikTok. <laughs> the death row TikTok. It's literally a hashtag death row talk. And like really? it tells you all about the process, what happens. They get treated like royalty for twenty four hours before and like 
I was just I got stuck in it. I couldn't get out of watching yeah, it. Yeah, because I've 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 watched documentaries on how people want to get onto it because they get the prisoners get treated a lot better, which is a wild concept <laughs> to th- yep. to think of. Um, I want to unpack what Morgan <laughs> is saying before I, I I bring up anything about what I say. Yeah, because what I'm hearing from Morgan is a very strong sense of justice. Right. Mm. That is effectively what I'm hearing from you is. Some people do crimes that are truly horrific. So yeah. life for life, death death row is okay. Yeah, and I'm not talking about death row for like a speeding fine or like <laughs> of either minimal crimes. Like I'm talking like it has to be horrific. Like if someone did a mass shooting on a school, I think that person should have the death penalty. Like mm. things like that. Like it's it's circumstantial, but I just think, yeah, well, I don't I, know. I must say your viewpoint is lining up very well with what we just read from Genesis 9. Mm. Like there's no conflicts there whatsoever, just support actually. And then I also have got stuck on the TikTok of where they bring church into the jail and people are like forgiven and they get baptised and all this. So then I'm like there is room for that, but there's also like a line and I think the death penalty, there's a time and a place for it. So I still believe in like forgiveness and like all that. But, yeah, I think a life for a life in different circumstances. Yeah, I'll jump off the back of what you said. I remember having a conversation like this in my youth group Bible study when I was a youth. And the position I landed on as a teenager was as long as someone is alive, they have a chance to accept Jesus. Therefore, we should always seek to prolong people's lives. So therefore, I landed against the death penalty. Now, that was me as a teenager. Um, I've done lots more thinking since then, but before I reveal any more of my thinking, <laughs> Josh hasn't yet given an answer. No, no, no. I'm and just, he's been wildly Bible flipping. So I've been, I'm curious I've been, as to what he's about to I was say. Like, I've just been, well, it's only because I'm only Bible flipping is because we, we were looking at Exodus before um, and I saw something in Exodus. I've just been intrigued by the duality of, of TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm sitting there like sobbing watching them worship in jail and then I'm on like death row TikTok. <laughs> yeah, like it's two very, very different things. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. And um, I don't know if we've got the time to unpack or or, or, <laughs> or, or, or that because I'm still just in, in shock that there, there's a subsection of it. But <laughs> so my question would be the definition of it. And that's where my brain's gone to of what are we – saying when we're saying that like the question does genesis 9 permit the death penalty and are we saying like and i guess this comes to an individual viewpoint but does when someone like performs the death penalty um let's put it that way when someone performs the the death penalty you know is that murder so if like if we look at it let's say from that viewpoint well then an easy way to then quickly like, go to in scripture is then just let's go to the 10 commandments and where it just says let's um do not murder mm. so then for me i'm sort of now thinking about of like what's the what's the definition here and does it say in genesis 9 like well if one person takes life then is it okay for then you to to, to take that life is it does it, like you know if someone murders someone else it's is it you murdering them or is that not murder i guess can i tell you the old testament view on the death penalty and mm-hmm. then that might answer a bunch of the questions you just raised and also push our conversation closer to the new testament yep the old testament law which we believe was given by god explicitly lists the death penalty for 16 different crimes and so just as a starting place the Bible is very clear that the death penalty in ancient Israel is very much okay, and not just okay, like mm. something to be done. There are obviously a few requirements. Deuteronomy 19 makes it clear that there has to be at least three witnesses. It also talks about the way that you are to carry out the death penalty, which is in a humane way. Like it's you can't do like slowly kill them by torture. The other interesting thing about the Old Testament and the death penalty is that for almost every case of the death penalty being the case, there is the allowance for other punishments, noticeably like paying an absolutely massive fine or ransom instead. However, for the crime of murder, the only permissible punishment is the death penalty. Mm. And so that's just like a very quick summary of the Old Testament's view in ancient Israel 
And I think coming through very early on from Genesis 9, because I do think that's what Genesis 9 is teaching, is that the death penalty is fine, therefore taking a life because someone has been found guilty at a fair trial is also totally morally okay and not a sin, Hmm. would be, I think, the very clear Old Testament teaching on the topic. Yep. So what does Jesus say about this? I don't think Jesus says enough to sway our opinion either way. Yep. I watched a video actually just the other day from Mike Winger. I've brought him up so many times on this podcast and I I don't apologize. He's really excellent at what he does. And he has a video called The Death Penalty is Biblical. And he goes from Genesis 9 all the way up to what is the role of government in Romans 13. And he lands in the conclusion that the death penalty is biblical for mm. crimes such as murder. Hmm. Um, I would encourage that video as a resource. Mm-hmm. I think part of me still goes back to that idea of as long as someone is alive, they have a chance to accept Jesus. Mm. It's what I said I held as a teenager and I still truly believe that as long as there is life, there is hope. Mm -hmm. But I think if you were to just take a biblical view, if you were to unpack all of the biblical passages, I do think you would end up in a place where it is totally permissible to have the death penalty for certain crimes, fair trial, not as revenge or vigilante justice Mm. as a government ordained action. I do Mm. think the Bible lands on death penalty is okay. Mm. And the Bible does teach that you have to, you're obeying the law of God, but you also need to obey the law, the the law of the land that you live in as as well. Mm. So it's not necessarily like, you know, it's not right out saying that you like, you can't like whatever, like whatever sort of laws, whatever sort of government sort of you that presides over you, you can't just ignore them. Mm. So if you live in a country where it does have the pen- death penalty, well, then there is a certain respect you have to have over that mm. in a very, very small, minor, like sort of saying in this con- in this conversation that we're having, humans are going to do human things. Like humans are always going to just like, like you know, we're, we're, we're sinful by nature, we're broken people, but we've also got free will. So we're just going to go about doing our business. And as you just said, like we've already witnessed this happen. So it was like God saying, well, look, if it's going to happen, mm. This is my like. This is my thoughts on the matter. Yeah, which is humankind is made in my image. Mm. Like that's how the verse starts. In my image, mankind is created. Therefore, life is probably one of the most sacred, incredible things that exists. Protect it. Protect it at all costs. And part of that protection in Genesis nine is punishing those who therefore don't. And that's why I talk about like let's not misconstrued or let's not like go down tangents on this because it is i think what you're saying this is a punishment thing Mm, very much so this is a reaction to someone else's action yes so our next question actually comes from one of my youth and because they're a minor i am not going to say their name um, but many of my youth listen along to the podcast and their question was why was pharaoh cursed in genesis 12 similarly why wasn't abram punished so I think we need to turn to Genesis 12. That is a really good question for a youth. I'm really impressed. My youth ask, honestly, some of the best questions ever. Like my favorite part of being a youth pastor is sitting, listening to their questions and then having conversations off that. And do you, do they listen to, do they listen to our podcast <laughs> by choice? Or do you I, to I do not, <laughs> I do not lock them in a room and play our podcast. In Is that fact, what you do for you every week? You just listen to the podcast? <laughs> in fact, I've never... I don't think openly told my youth about the podcast. I openly tell my leaders and then my leaders have made it well known amongst the youth that I do a podcast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I promise I'm not just telling everyone everywhere. Slash I should be. I got a sermon in a few weeks. Maybe I'll just put on an episode. Anyway, Genesis 12 is when Abram and Sarai go down to Egypt to escape a famine. Abram lies to Pharaoh and says, Sarai's just my sister. So Pharaoh takes Sarai into his harem to be one of his wives or concubines. And then Pharaoh's household is afflicted with all of these plagues. And my youth had the question of Pharaoh did nothing wrong because he was lied to. So why does he get cursed? And Abram is like lying the entire time. And then at the very end, he gets blessed beyond belief with all these riches and Pharaoh lets him leave unharmed. I wrote next to 12 when we were doing this and I highlighted and I just wrote trust in faith. So I'm not sure if it was just like trusting in the process and like mm. having grace. Is that why? Mm. If that makes sense. Like 
Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good starting place. Yeah, because I think you know, simply we we look at the promise that was given to Abraham, mm. um, which was whoever harms Abraham or whoever like does anything like like God's going to protect Abraham and his kin, and mm. then their kin, and their kin, and their kin. So you know, I think simplistically, well, God's just protecting Abraham. And then, like that goes back to your point, like um, Morgan, which is like trust, like you know, trusting that process and uh, just having faith that God will always protect. Now, that doesn't answer the, the 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 question and look at the point of like, well, why does Abraham get off scot free? You ever considered becoming a youth pastor, Josh? Because <laughs> <laughs> what you just said is exactly how I answered the question as well. Mm. When we look at the promises to Abram, it's I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Mm. Now knowingly or unknowingly pharaoh 100% cursed abram by taking his wife away mm. like that is doing great harm to abram and the promise of god mm-hmm. and god keeps his promises even though pharaoh did nothing wrong and abram was a liar and sinning in this moment mm-hmm. god still keeps to his promises because if you remember god gave this promise to abram without expecting anything back this mm. wasn't a promise of if you are faithful i will keep these promises God promised that these things would be true no matter what. And Mm. so God absolutely sticks to his promises of cursing those who curse Abram. Mm. Now, Abram does get off fairly scot-free, but I think we see tremendous growth in Abram as a character because in the very next chapter, he suddenly becomes this super generous, super holy man. And I think it's because he's learned a great lesson. His lesson is, my actions and decision greatly affect those around me. I've been called to be a blessing to the nations. Like that is one of the things God asks or commands of Abram to be a blessing to the nations. Mm -hmm. And Abram starts to live out that slightly better after this interaction. And so Pharaoh was cursed because God promised he would protect Abram. And God's not going to go back on what he says. Mm. Uh, You know, that's the, he can't go back on, on that, especially when it was clearly stated that like, He's no, not looking for anything in return. Mm. You know, in a way, this is showing and proving that, look, no matter what happens, God is going to actually protect you mm. and your family here. Yeah. It's proof of the promise mm. as a very starting place. Yeah. Our next question comes from Jordan, and he asks, does anything change if Cain came to God asking for forgiveness instead of lying? Now, if we remember the story of Cain and Abel, Cain... Murdered Abel. <laughs> he did. <laughs> and when Cain was questioned about this interaction, Cain lies and doesn't actually admit to his uh, wrongdoings. Mm. Yes. So this is Genesis 4, which is episode 3 of our season for those who are trying to place exactly where this is. So, so, so specifically, it says in the text... One day, Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Afterwards, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? And, you know, continues continues on. So that, like, that very first instance, Cain doesn't admit to what he's done he's trying to lie get his way out of out of it and they really sort of using a poor excuse of oh what am i meant to be looking after my brother Hmm. when god knows exactly what's happened yes so the question is if instead of lying like we just read that he did if he came asking forgiveness what happens like does that change the story would that change god's response i want to say no and this is me just just having a stab (laughs) it's just Having a stab. Um, <laughs> sort of like Cain did. Yeah, I know, right? Um, I think God still would have given the same punishment mm. um, for it. I think there was still like a, a crime committed. Mm-hmm. And I don't think just by him seeking forgiveness would have excused what he did entirely. Maybe the punishment might have been slightly different or may have been maybe not as intense, but I think that punishment still very much would have been there in that sort of like banishment, that sort of like, you know, the the ground will not yield any good crops. You're going to be working the like the, the hard land and walking alone, like homeless nomadic lifestyle. Like I think maybe that 
would have still been there. Fair. And and maybe we would have, as as readers, we would have gotten more that sort of like, no matter how great your sin is, you should still seek, like you should still try and seek forgiveness in it. And maybe we've got on at that, but I don't think much would have changed. I want to give the exact opposite viewpoint. Okay. Which is, I think the story would be completely different if Cain comes to God asking forgiveness, seeking repentance, telling the truth. Now, part of my evidence for this is the entirety of Christianity, which is <laughs> in our sins, we come to God, we repent, he forgives. Mm. I also want to point us to one specific Old Testament story that I think has parallels, which is helpful to see God's response, mm. which is the story of King David in 2 Samuel, specifically chapters 11 and 12, which is David sees a woman, he takes her for himself, he organizes, so therefore is responsible for the death of her husband mm. so that he can then marry her. And then the prophet Nathan rocks up and he tells David, you have sinned before the Lord. Like you are evil. You are sinful. David falls to his knees and says, you're right. I repent. I'm sorry. And God forgives mm. David. Now there are still consequences, but not necessarily strictly on David because mm. of his repentance. And so I think if Cain came before God in repentance, we would see a different story. Mm. And this probably talks about how we forget how gracious God is. Like we mm. forget how we have a loving, forgiving God. And like, you know, we obviously know that through like through Jesus and through like um, he, it's the ultimate way and he will forgive our sins. But we get stuck, like as I did, on the... The, the need for justice mm -hmm. from a human point of view and going down that right when we like just simply forget that this is this is God that we're talking about this is someone that who is willing to forgive you mm. although I do think it's interesting that we've just looked at two stories where a murder is committed and death is not the punishment mm. given our previous discussion on the death penalty <laughs> I think potentially there is some more thinking to be done given that new little bit of extra weight or evidence that's been submitted there. Yes. But maybe that's a different discussion we've already gone for a long time. Going back off that discussion, you could just then say, well, shouldn't God kill Cain? Yeah. Yeah. If God's standard is always life for life, mm. Cain should be dead and David should be dead. Mm. Both committed murder. I mean, arguably, you could you could argue that uh, the punishment God gives to Cain is sort of putting him to, is putting him to death, not straight away, but for the, like, eventually. Eventually. But... Maybe. Maybe. It's all <laughs> you know, I'm prepared to yeah, comment yeah, at this point yeah. in time. No, it's it's all hearsay slash, you know, we, we just don't know. <laughs> yeah. And that's part of what we've just been asked here is a hypothetical. Mm. And when you play the what if game, you get confused and muddy so quickly because we don't have what ifs. We have the event. Yes. We have what actually happened. And so I try really hard to not play the what if game when I come to reading scripture. I, I And I think that's really important because if we start to play the what if game then we start to play god yeah which is not what this is all about yes because only he has the answer to the what ifs yes sorry to rebuke your question jordan <laughs> <laughs> i think that's a wrap folks is that a rapidly wrap no other quick ones we just want to do or they were going to be longer but... nah i reckon seven questions like the seven days of creation <laughs> Thank you to everyone that has submitted uh, their questions, that have uh, brought in their comments and their thoughts on this book of Genesis. We've um, tried our best and uh, had good discussions mm. on on these questions. And like what we've said through, I think, most of them, we could spend an entire episode on like one question, really sort of getting into the nitty gritty of it and sort of going through every uh, bit and like jumping into the Bible. But hopefully that answers, you know, as you as the listener answers uh, those questions that you have. And if we didn't get to your question, that's okay. Still send them through. Um, we we see them. Uh, we might, you know, even just sort of shoot you a message if you um, send it just as a, as an answer. But we'd love to, to continue to see those, those questions, but also those um, comments and thoughts that you have on the, the book of Genesis. So keep up to date with all our social 
social medias there and our Patreon, as we've said before. Head over to Patreon to see what that's all about to financially support us. And don't forget to share this podcast around. We want it to spread amongst everyone, but we also want the word of God to be able to be spread to everyone. Just be end with a prayer. Yeah. How about I wrap us up? Yeah. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Genesis that we've had the opportunity to dig into and explore and discover you throughout over these past few weeks. We do pray that for all of the people who listen to this podcast, they would be encouraged in their faith, encouraged to seek you more and encouraged to read your word more. And so we thank for this opportunity. Amen. Amen. Lachlan and Morgan, thank you for your time. Everyone that's watching and listening, thank you. And we'll see everyone in the new season. In the next season. Yes. Bye. 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 A Mustard Seed Creative Production.